Hello everyone, welcome to GGN. Today is Monday, October 1st, 2012, and I'm Darko. Thank you for joining me, and this first uh, video is going to be on geopolitics. So I'm hoping I can get all this into one and maybe do uh, something different with the economy and that and other news, uh, big, a lot of Big Brother news. Um, so but we'll see. It says here, in 10 years there will be no more Israel, says Henry Kissinger. The, the idea of Israel's collapse is no longer a taboo uh, subject as more top brass U.S. officials are uh, basically explicitly attesting to the fact with prominent U.S. diplomat Henry Kissinger saying in 10 years there will be no more Israel. His uh, statement is flat and unqualified. He's not saying that Israel is in danger but could be saved if we could just give it additional trillions of dollars and uh, smashed enough of its enemies with our military. says uh, he is not offering a way out. He is simply stating a fact. And in 2022, Israel will no longer exist, as political columnist Kevin Barrett wrote. In. He also says it will become ever easier for American policymakers following in the footsteps of Kissinger and the 16 intelligence agencies to recognize the obvious, which is Israel has reached the end of its shelf life. And he's talking about um, this U.S. intelligence community compromise of a 16 U.S. intelligence agencies earlier this year titled Preparing for a Post-Israel Middle East. So this does actually make you wonder, is this what I was talking about as far as it uh, being created by the powers that be and then it could be, it's planned to be destroyed by the powers that be? Um, or is it like this? We're saying that, um, that Israel cannot withstand the coming pro-Palestinian juggernaut consisting of the Arab Spring, Islamic Awakening, and uh, a lot of this was it's basically anti-West uh, sentiment, but also because of the drone strikes and whatnot, regime changes, uh, like the Arab Spring. But that wasn't uh, that wasn't grassroots. So I'm just wondering, like, like what happened with all of the Islamic governments, uh, you know, extremists, or not extremists, but basically Islamic governments uh, uh, taking place in Egypt and Libya and stuff like that. Um, according to the sources that I was coming across, they're saying that it wasn't actually part of the plan. So who knows if this was uh, not part of the plan either. 7,500 U.S. officials serve Israeli interests. Tel Aviv is the biggest threat to the United States. An international lawyer said that. While the U.S. intelligence community considers Israel the greatest threat to America's national interests, there are about 7,500 U.S. politicians or congressmen or sellouts in Washington who do Israel's bidding, said Franklin Lamb. The international lawyer also went on to say Israel is currently the greatest threat to the United States national interest because its nature and actions prevent normal U.S. relations with Arab and Muslim countries and to a growing degree the wider international community. And um, some developments have been going on with Syria. Uh, the West hasn't got their, uh, their regime change as fast as, they, uh, as fast as they wanted. So now, all of a sudden, Qatar, who has been behind a lot of it, or most of it, the entire time, Saudi Arabia, is coming out right out in the spotlight, along with Turkey, who's been basically pushing this thing uh, the entire time as well. Coming out in the spotlight, no longer a mystery, and it says why Qatar wants to invade Syria. So it says the MR of Qatar is on a roll. What an entrance at the UN Assembly in New York, the Sheik, called for an Arab coalition of the willing-style invasion of Syria, and no less. In the words of the Emir, it is better for Arab countries themselves to interfere out of their national, humanitarian, political, and military duties and to do what is necessary to stop the bloodshed in Syria. He stressed Arab countries had a military duty to invade. So what he means by Arab countries is the petro monarchies of the Gulf Counter-Revolution Club, or the GCC, previously known as the Gulf Cooperation Council with implicit help from Turkey. So is the Emir now preaching an Arab version of the R, sorry, the R2P responsibility to protect doctrine advanced by the three graces of humanitarian intervention, Hillary Clinton, Suzanne Rice, and Samantha Power? Remember, this is one of the other things that were um, uh, kind of uh, planned as well as far as, um, you know, getting the regime change and intervention, declaring a humanitarian corridor, i.e. drones. But that article, just uh, it just kind of came out. Uh, from what September 28th we have this one September 26th that I held on to this article can a military coup occur in the GCC countries so we were just talking about this earlier this year an unsuccessful military coup was staged in Qatar against the US backed Amir Sheikh according to the Saudi financed um, TV channel uh, 2012 in April furthermore a number of high ranking military officers rose against the Qatari MR it added triggering fierce clashes between some 30 military officers and U.S.-backed Royal Guards outside the Emir's palace. 
The coup was foiled following the arrest of the officers involved. American helicopters reportedly transferred the Qatari Amir and his wife to an unknown location. Meanwhile, inform Kuwaiti sources said that meditated or sorry mediated recent disputes between Saudi Arabia and Qatar have unveiled a new series of disagreements between the officials of the two Persian Gulf states. In a telephone conversation, the Qatari premier envisioned a definite overthrow of the Saudi regime, saying Qatar will step in if the Al Khatif and the Al Shaqia regions one day and Saudi Arabia will be disintegrated. Lastly, the Qatari Emir came to power following a U.S. backed coup against his father in 1995. The U.S. offers tens of millions more in funding for Syria rebels and Russia's warning foreign aid, saying that it's just prolonging the civil war. So I was covering Iraq recently about how they were trying to get uh, an oil an oil deal going with the Kurds, uh, trying to create a new flag, a new national anthem, and stuff like that. Now it says that they're actually, Iraq's pushing a two-stage plan that would bring both sides together for talks on political transition that would end, that, uh, would end the fighting. But the U.S., for its part, it does not seem to be on board for the talks and said pledging tens of millions of dollars in additional funding for the rebel fighters. According and when I saw th this article, it actually ties in and makes a lot of sense, tying in the Qatari uh, Turkey backs um, uh, uh, plan, right? The GCC and that Syrian rebel backers block arms cash until bickering factions unite. So we've seen I've been covering about um, the recent rebel leader of the Free Syrian Army actually defecting back to the Syrian government forces. So, you know, and there's been a lot of split between these uh, jihadists and extremists that are getting in um, with this normal, I guess you call it, rebel army. And they're, it, so they're now they're kind of uh, split, kind of like the militias in Libya. But it says stockpiles of arms, including anti-aircraft, anti-tank missiles, are being held in Turkey where most of it's coming for, from over the border, for use by rebels in Syria's civil war. But their distribution is being held up because of uh, disunity and feuding between the different groups of fighters. Independent has learned out of the UK. It says here in a high-level discussions, Qatari, Qatari and Turkish suppliers told opposition representatives that heavy weapons would not be available until the various factions agreed to form a coherent command structure. Just recently, I remember the Free Syrian Army um, uh, the transnational government for what they're fighting for as far as the regime change goes after they get Assad out of there was based in Turkey and then they moved it uh, recently to Syria, inside Syria, which is a show of confidence. But also you had France saying, what, you need to form a government and then the rebels started to actually hold a kind of an ad hoc uh, political meeting and stuff like that to form a government. So, but it, uh, yeah, Qatar, Qatar and Turkey say they need to form a structured military council and come up with coordinated operational plans. The U.S. and Gulf countries seek an advanced missile defense plan. So him and the uh, U.S. and his Gulf partners are looking to deepen cooperation on missile defense as tensions rise with Iran. Look at this. It says uh, Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State of the U.S., met with the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC. They just keep popping up all of a sudden, don't they? Officials in New York as Washington seeks to boost regional defenses against perceived Iranian threats. So like I said, Turkey's playing a dangerous game. You have... Um, uh, Webster Tarpley, the analyst, saying Turkey involved in a no-win Syria project. We had Turkish Foreign Minister uh, here this week in the, Uni in the United Nations. He doesn't seem to understand that he's embarked on a no-win project to the extent that the Turks insist on destabilizing Syria, the necessary almost mechanical consequences that the Kurds would be encouraged to destabilize Turkey. Tarpley said the best advice to Turkey is, you've built a great nation, you should save it. Don't go any further down this road. According to the analyst, there are two dangerous issues resulting from the recent talks in the United Nations. The first, Tarpley says, is a proposal by the Qatari's crown prince, Sheikh, uh, to have an Arab League invasion of Syria. The second is a French proposal calling for some kind of humanitarian corridor or safe zone, which would mean, again, invading Syria and trying to take over sovereign territory of Syria. I saw this article kind of stuck out. It's from September 27th. Turkey's Erdogan slams Russia, China, Iran over Syria. He lashed out at Russia, China, and Iran on Thursday, saying their stance on the crisis in neighboring Syria was allowing a master to go unabated. So, yeah, kind of interesting. He accused uh, uh, Syria's Assad of creating a terrorist state, allowing the Syrian opposition to organize on Turkish soil. That's right, the rebels and the terrorists and that, they would go and fight in Syria, kill some government forces and some civilians, and then they would go back over the border to regroup and rest and recruit others. And then pushing 
This is what Turkey was doing. Turkey was also pushing for a foreign protected safe zone inside of Syria, i.e. a humanitarian corridor, which is backed by France, um, i.e., like I said, they're going to have drones basically surveilling. This is interesting. They say, Turkey says, the main source of disappointment is Russia. And China stands by Russia. And then, of course, dragging Iran into it. Well, you know, Iran is pretty self-explanatory. The goal to bring down Syria and the regime change is to is directly related to Iran. And uh, then you have Russia, though, right? Russia will not grant asylum to Syrian President Lavrov. So... Um, we have right here, no, we won't grant him asylum. Also, we will not tell him to go. He says this will be his decision if he steps down. So what they're doing now is with uh, Syria, and this is a, someone in the comment board made a pretty good observation um, as far as when I covered this last time, which is, it's you know, it's pretty obvious what where Russia was doing with this when this came out, September 27th, which is, you know, ultimately with Syria, it's directed towards Iran and, um, and Russia, right? And with Turkey, like I said, they create a little Kurdistan proxy state, um, they can use that as a kind of a corridor to send terrorists and that from North Africa into Rus onto Russia's doorstep. So I guess Russia, the way they see it is it's inevitable what's going to happen here in Syria as far as regime change goes. They, but you can see how they're being, uh, they're being kind of hooked into this now. And this, this is the icing on the cake, right, as far as making my point. Russia, this is coming out of the Times of Israel just re over this Monday, this over this weekend. Russia told Assad to shoot down Turkish plane and murder captured pilots, leaked Syrian document show. So I don't believe that whatsoever. But what you could see what they're doing. They're trying to say that uh, Russia is pulling uh, Syria's strings. So this is a Turkish, Turkish jet that flew into sovereign airspace, um... And the Syrian government apologized and said, actually, we're surprised it was even shot down. Um, I guess it was automatic surface to air, and uh, they shot it down with, with machine guns. But Russia is saying our role in downing the Turkish jet in Syria is fantasy and nonsense. So Russia's statement uh, basically said, it is ridiculous even to comment on this nonsense, but unfortunately we have to. This came from a Saudi-owned news channel, Al Arabia. And this is something I, I think we all pretty much understand. The U.S. delisted the MKO, the MEK, or the Mujahideen to use it against Iran, says the Iranian uh, military. It says that it was used to create insecurity and acts of sabotage in border areas of Iran and other regions. Iran also said they're going to hold U.S. and MKO accountable for any future crimes against the nation in any part of the world. And this is something I never even heard of in the news at all. Western media, assault on Iranian diplomat premeditated plot. A senior Iranian diplomat has slammed the recent assault against Iran's foreign minister in New York as a premeditated plot. By who? By the MKO. It says here the M MKO attack against the Iranian diplomat in a country which claims to be advocating democracy and human rights is in a violation of international regulations and a blow to the bogus claims of the so-called human rights advocates. Supporters of the Mujahideen or MKO attacked the uh, minister near the United Nations headquarters in the presence of New York police on September 26th. New York police and U.S. security forces made no arrest as the attackers physically abused members of Iranian delegation accompanying the president of Iran at the U.N. The U.N. is trying to make Armenia its ally in the region, says the Truman National Security Project. The second largest uh, American embassy is actually in Armenia, besides Iraq. Azerbaijan is aiding Israel against Iran. Well, you know Israel sold them weapons, but we also know what? That the United States will give Azerbaijan the northern area in, of Iran in exchange for participation in the war. And Georgia and the United States are going to discuss danger emanating from Russia military bases in Armenia. The number of Russian troops is 5,000. Of course, the elections in Georgia are also um, being discussed as well. I remember I've been covering this about how everybody's watching it. Georgian opposition party wins majority of votes, says early results. So the Western-backed uh, puppet, Saakashvili, is, is losing. Which is why Bloomberg was saying, ignore the Georgian elections at your own risk because of the trouble caucus regions and how the election was the least predictable in history. Pakistan and China join hands against India? They're saying Chinese and Pakistan intelligence agencies are working in tandem to create mayhem in India's northeastern region. China's leading foreign policy expert has warned that China and Japan are heading for a military clash. You have Manila deploying 800 more troops to guard disputed islands against China. And as, as a battered NATO is considering early Afghanistan withdrawal, China's eyeing Afghan's gold mine after the first Chinese visit since the 1960s. 
This is GGN and I'm Darko. Thank you.